Good afternoon and welcome once again to the Technical Forum at the Group Exhibit Hydrogen Fuel Cells and Batteries at Hanover Fair 2016. Our next topic on stage is spectrocarb porous graphite current collectors for proton exchange membrane electrolyzer applications. We have with us today Chris Parabo, the Managing Director of CapLink Europe, uh, representing Engineered Fibers Technology from Kinetic. P Connecticut, I'm sorry. Please join me in welcoming him on stage. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to uh, give you an idea for what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to start by giving a bit of background information about uh, Kaplink and uh, EFT. Then I'll be talking about uh, proton exchange membrane electrolyzer market and then specifically the carbon panel production process and how the focus uh, for both PEMS and the panel process is uh, cost reduction. So Kaplink is an internet age a market partner. Unlike uh, traditional distributors that uh, take the buy materials from their supplier at a discount and sell them to their customers or traditional agents that sell their products for a commission, uh, Kaplink works with suppliers to act as an extension of their organization by using the tools and the techniques that multinationals use uh, to be able to get, bring suppliers' products into the European marketplace. So that allows our suppliers to not have to have a European uh, entity while still maintaining a European presence. We do that with three, three ways. One is by doing order fulfillment, which means we take care of the logistics and the uh, custom clearance and the warehousing so that the suppliers can actually uh, sell directly to their customers in Europe. We also do it with um, um, technical marketing where we translate the information technically into visuals and into text so that our customers can understand it. And then also we have technical representation where we go speak to the customers to understand their wants and their needs. Engineered Fibers Technology is a high, uh, high technology fibers company with the core competency in uh, precision shortcut fibers. It's uh, established in uh, 1998 with uh, founding members of over 30 years uh, experience in the industry. Uh, they're focused, uh, uh, they do specifically a lot of uh, precision shortcut fibers and also with the spectrocarb material, which I'll, which I'll get to more specifically. Uh, headquartered in uh, Shelton, Connecticut, with a 21,000 square foot uh, facility. The spectrocarb story goes back to about 1991, uh, where spectrocarb did a lot of work with very thin films. These are some of the very th uh, first uh, carbon paper very thin carbon papers used for uh, fuel cells. And they did a lot of work with the Department of Energy and had some of the first uh, contracts with the Department of Energy. Uh, through 1991 to, uh, or in 2005, EFT acquired SpectraCarb and SpectraCorb and, and uh, inherited the products and continued to develop those products both with engineering technology as well as services to the customers. Uh, in 2013 was the first uh, year that uh, Caplink was involved with EFT and we did a partnership together since 2013 when we've been at the Hanover Mesa uh, every year since 2013. Fuel cells and electrolyzers. In 2013 when uh, Caplink was first here, I was told that uh, the gas diffusion layer was the technology of the future for fuel cells. It still is. It still is. Uh, today it's the technology of the future. But the fuel cells in the electrolyzer are uh, opposite sides of the same coin. The fuel cells have take hydrogen in and put electricity out, and uh, electrolyzers take electricity in and put hydrogen out. Uh, both of them require a gas diffusion layer, but the gas diffusion layers that are typically used for both of those are, uh, have different requirements, which I'll get into. But the market is definitely calling for electrolyzers. Uh, the markets for, for example, with biogas plants, which use the electrolyzers that generate the H2 to uh, convert carbon dioxide into methane and water. Also for hydrogen fuel for electromobility, as, we d as was uh, presented in the presentation just before mine. Also for power grid stabilization, really understanding how we can store energy is still a big, uh, big challenge and uh, shows the needs for electrolyzers. 
And then obviously remote hydrogen production, not necessarily for energy storage, but for the production of hydrogen is really driving the use of electrolyzers. An interesting uh, application of an electrolyzer is also what uh, TU and Delft in the Netherlands, in partnership with Nuon, the big energy company in the Netherlands, is that has actually using uh, the electrolyzer to combine with nitrogen. And that combination then creates ammonia, and then that is what's actually used to generate the electricity. And by using ammonia for uh, an e for an energy source to create electricity, there's no uh, carbon dioxide that's burned off in the process. So where in the world is it being used? Electrolyzers are used in, in the United States. Uh, generally, the United States is lagging behind the rest of the world for ener recognizing the energy storage need. But California is still a, a, a good example of the infrastructure that's being brought into place for electromobility applications. In Germany, electrolyzers can be used for uh, the generation of H2, which is then fed back into the, the grid for, of methane, which can accept a certain amount of hydrogen into the methane lines. And also in the Netherlands, as explained, the uh, nitrogen hydrogen is used to produce uh, ammonia. And then in areas such as Brazil, India, and Africa, remote locations where it doesn't make sense or is too difficult for infrastructure to actually supply H2, then electrolyzers are used uh, to generate H2 remotely. SpectraCarb is used in different, SpectraCarb has got a number of different products and a number of different grades used for different various applications. As mentioned already, the thin versions were used for uh, fuel cells and also some thinner and thicker ones used for uh, vanadium uh, redox batteries, which we've seen more applications this year, uh, even though we thought that it was becoming less interesting over the past few years. And the ultracapacitors using uh, anisotropic uh, carbon uh, or um, an activated carbon uh, fabric for ultracapacitors. And the one that I want to speak to specifically is for PEM electrolyzers, where the carbon panels in actually much thicker versions than the one that I just showed recently are used for, are very well suited for uh, the PEM electrolyzer. So in the PEM electrolyzer, this is really the, the, what we're talking about here. We're really referring specifically to the cathode side of the stack to be used as the current collector. On the anode side is still the uh, sinter titanium, which is predominantly used. But on this side, I want to show the advantages of using uh, carbon panels as opposed to sinter titanium for this process. So as opposed to uh, GDL papers or felts or cloths, which are typically very, very thin, the process of the carbon panels allows them to be made in very, very thick sheets, as opposed to the felts and the cloths, which are often only limited in their thicknesses. In, uh, in the thicknesses. Also, the uh, way that the materials are produced allows us to get very dense materials too. So the uniqueness of the carbon paper panels is really to be able to get both a thick sheet and a very dense sheet. So the, the, they could be as thin as 130 microns and as thick as almost four millimeters. Potentially could even be thicker than that as well too. So compared to sinter titanium, there's a thickness advantage to the carbon sheets. The carbon sheets, uh, titanium could also be made in such thick layers, but it's a linear re relationship with the cost of the material. Unlike the carbon panel process, it's not a linear relationship uh, when you go to thicker substrates. Also on the, uh, on the uh, cathode side of the stack, there's an effect, long-term reliability, the compressed hydrogen makes the sinter titanium malleable. But that's not, that doesn't have the same effect with the carbon panels. The compressibility, these sheets can actually be compressed quite significantly. A three millimeter thick disc can be compressed down to about two millimeters under, under pressure, which makes for a nice seal as well too, which is the most common defect in, in the uh, PEM electrolyzers is the leakage. Sinter titanium, on the other hand, is not, uh, is not compressible. It's very rigid. Compression set, the materials of the carbon papers are actually operate like an elastic. So they can be uh, compressed repeatedly 
uh, with a perfectly elastic, perfectly elastic behavior. Uh, Sinter titanium, on the other hand, is not compressible, so it doesn't have that effect. Uh, the pore size for Sinter titanium can be between 20 and 100 microns, whereas uh, the uh, carbon panels have a random distribution, but an average pore size of, of about 20 microns. Uh, also, compared to uh, titanium and also to felts, we can get a very high porosity. Porosity is as high as 70 to 75 percent, sometimes even a bit higher as well, too, compared to uh, sinter titanium, which could be much less. And in uh, volume, both in low volumes and higher volumes, there's a cost advantage to using carbon panels as opposed to sinter titanium. If you take a look at uh, the surface of these carbon panels, it actually looks quite smooth. And when we talk about surface area, we're not talking about surface area that you see here and that you see here. When you do a zoom in on the panels themselves, what you see when you zoom in is it's really actually a quite complex mesh of fibers that are graphitized. And this complex mesh gives a whole lot of surface area around the individual carbon fibers, which allows it to have a very high surface area uh, for tact as a GDL. Now, the process used to make the panels is actually a wet laid, pour, uh, wet laid process, which is uh, the same process used in the paper making. So when you go through the process here, it's a very flexible and versatile process that you can add a wide range of carbon fibers, and then you can add up other components to the paper making process. When you do the resin impregnation, then you do the molding and the curing. This process here is then the graphitization. When it's put into the furnaces at temperatures as high as 2,000 and plus degrees Celsius, then that's what uh, gives the, pr the products its final properties. And then after the material is done, then there's machining and other handling uh, procedures and processes that are do done to give it the specific porosity and density that uh, we can cater to. The advantage of the uh, paper making process is that it's very versatile. There's a lot of things that we can add into that process while we're going along. Uh, it's also scalable, so you can take it from lab scale up to pilot plant, up to uh, production plant quite easily. And the tolerance, because of the process, it allows for a very wide tolerance control over the thickness and the density and the porosity. We can make it in a very small scale, and we can get a very high density because of the way that the product is manufactured. So, during one of my earlier present, one of the earlier presentations here, the question was, uh, so there's really three important things that that's on everyone's mind, and it's cost, cost, cost. How can you bring down the costs? And that's what I wanted to talk about. The first is bringing down the cost of the PEM electrolyzers themselves. The first way to do it is to increase uh, the active area. And the spectrocarb material lends itself to be able to give very uh, big, sub big areas, sometimes as big as one meter by one meter. So the spectrocarb lends itself to that process to help PEMs become less expensive. At the higher pressure, if you can produce a PEM electrolyzer with a higher pressure, then it means that your customers can use uh, less expensive compressors, which mean, and the spectrocarb materials are very well suited to uh, very high pressures as well too. Reduce the material cost, compared to sinter titanium, the carbon panels can be much less expensive. And if you increase the useful life of the PEM, and when people go uh, looking at the PEMs and servicing these, uh, the PEMs, uh, what they often find when they take the units apart is they see that the panels uh, can last for a very long time in the service of the electrolyzer. When we look specifically at reducing the cost of the panels themselves, then there's three areas that we focus on. The one area is to optimize the furnace runs. The furnace runs up to 2,000, 3,000 degrees Celsius are very expensive. If we can optimize those, to plan those, to make sure that the ovens are full so that we can get uh, better uh, usage of the furnaces, then that will help reduce the cost of the uh, panels. Also, low volumes are expensive. Whether you do one panel or 10,000 panels, the cost is, uh, for the furnace run is going to be the same. So uh, with scale becomes economies of scale, which means that we can reduce the cost per unit and the cost per square centimeter of the panels. Also to reduce the machining cost, if we can work with uh, PEM electrolyzer manufacturers to be able to accept a greater tolerance, then the machining cost, which represents almost a third of the final cost, can be reduced. And finally, if you, to make um, 
to make this shape, for example, typically they're, they're taken from very large panels and, and then cut out, which means there's a lot of waste. We can obviously make a mold that's exactly suited to the, to the size, to the PEM electrolyzer of the customer, but then we have to know ahead of time what that size is going to be and to be able to have the volume of panels that justifies making such an investment. So the GDL panels that uh, we have in our portfolio uh, can go from very thin to very high, but all of which, and uh, the naming nomenclature really comes from the thickness of the material and the density of the material. And you see that all of them have very high porosities, above 70%, except when you get into very high dense of those density materials. And the production cap capability of this, of SpectraCarb now, is uh, upwards of 50,000 sheets per year of 40 by 40 or 50 by 50 uh, sheets. And larger sheets are possible and theoretically uh, we can produce as large as one meter by one meter sheets. So that's all that I have for today. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to take them or you could see us uh, later on at booth uh, D35. Any questions from the audience at this time? Just raise your hand. No? Um, I'm, I have a question then. I'm interested of the, the ratio of the, how much surface area there is internally versus externally. A whole lot more, actually. If you take a look at the surface area in here, you could see that this is one surface area, but it's actually made up of a number of laminates. And so there's actually the surface area on each one of them, and it's actually what it would be in terms of number. I'm sure it could be calculated. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, please stick around. Coming up next uh, from uh, Lean Cat from the Czech Republic, we have Professor Vladimir uh, Matolin, who is the head of R&D. The topic will be advanced proton exchange membrane fuel cells, nanostructured thin film catalysts with low platinum content. Please stick around. <laughs>